This is Chapter Forty of A Tramp Abroad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Tramp Abroad by Mark Twain. Chapter Forty. Piteous Relics at Chamonix. I am not so ignorant about glacial movement now as I was when I took passage on the Gorner Glacier. I have read up since. I am aware that these vast bodies of ice do not travel at the same rate of speed. While the Gorner Glacier makes less than an inch a day, the Unterar Glacier makes as much as eight, and still other glaciers are said to go twelve, sixteen, and even twenty inches a day. One writer says that the slowest glacier travels twenty-five feet a year, and the fastest four hundred. What is a glacier? It is easy to say it looks like a frozen river which occupies the bed of a winding gorge or gully between mountains, but that gives no notion of its vastness, for it is sometimes six hundred feet thick, and we are not accustomed to rivers six hundred feet deep. No, our rivers are six feet, twenty feet, and sometimes fifty feet deep. We are not quite able to grasp so large a fact as an ice river six hundred feet deep. The glacier's surface is not smooth and level, but has deep swales and swelling elevations, and sometimes has the look of a tossing sea whose turbulent billows were frozen hard in the instant of their most violent motion. The glacier's surface is not a flawless mass, but is a river with cracks or crevices, some narrow, some gaping wide. Many a man, the victim of a slip or a misstep, has plunged down one of these and met his death. Men have been fished out of them alive, but it was when they did not go to a great depth. The cold of the great depths would quickly stupefy a man, whether he was hurt or unhurt. These cracks do not go straight down. One can seldom see more than twenty to forty feet down them. Consequently, men who have disappeared in them have been sought for in the hope that they had stopped within helping distance, whereas their case, in most instances, had really been hopeless from the beginning. In 1864, a party of tourists was descending Mont Blanc, and while picking their way over one of the mighty glaciers of that lofty region, roped together as was proper, a young porter disengaged himself from the line and started across an ice-bridge which spanned a crevice. It broke under him with a crash, and he disappeared. The others could not see how deep he had gone, so it might be worth while to try and rescue him. A brave young guide named Michel Payot volunteered. Two ropes were made fast to his leather belt, and he bore the end of the third one in his hand to tie to the victim in case he found him. He was lowered into the crevice, he descended deeper and deeper between the clear blue walls of solid ice, he approached a bend in the crack and disappeared under it. Down and still down he went, into this profound grave. When he had reached a depth of eighty feet, he passed under another bend in the crack, and thence descended eighty feet lower as between perpendicular precipices. Arrived at this stage of one hundred and sixty feet below the surface of the glacier, he peered through the twilight dimness and perceived that the chasm took another turn and stretched away at a steep slant to unknown deeps, for its course was lost in darkness. What a place that was to be in, especially if that leather belt should break! The compression of the belt threatened to suffocate the intrepid fellow. He called to his friends to draw him up, but could not make them hear. They still lowered him deeper and deeper. Then he jerked his third cord as vigorously as he could, his friends understood, and dragged him out of those icy jaws of death. Then they attached a bottle to a cord and sent it down two hundred feet, but it found no bottom. It came up covered with congelations, evidence enough that even if the poor porter reached the bottom with unbroken bones, a swift death from cold was sure anyway. A glacier is a stupendous ever-progressing, resistless plough. It pushes ahead of it masses of boulders which are packed together, and they stretch across the gorge, right in front of it, like a long grave or long, sharp roof. This is called a moraine. It also shoves out a moraine along each side of its course. Imposing as the modern glaciers are, they are not so huge as were some that once existed. For instance, Mr. Wimper says, at some very remote period 
the valley of Aosta was occupied by a vast glacier, which flowed down its entire length from Mont Blanc to the plain of Piedmont, remained stationary, or nearly so, at its mouth for many centuries, and deposited there enormous masses of debris. The length of this glacier exceeded eighty miles, and it drained a basin twenty-five to thirty-five miles across, bounded by the highest mountains in the Alps. The great peaks rose several thousand feet above the glaciers, and then, as now, shattered by sun and frost, poured down their showers of rocks and stones, in witness of which there are the immense piles of angular fragments that constitute the moraines of Ivrea. The moraines around Ivrea are of extraordinary dimensions. That which was on the left bank of the glacier is about thirteen miles long, and in some places rises to a height of two thousand one hundred and thirty feet above the floor of the valley. The terminal moraines, those which are pushed in front of the glaciers, cover something like twenty square miles of country. At the mouth of the valley of Aosta the thickness of the glacier must have been at least two thousand feet, and its width, at that part, five miles and a quarter. It is not easy to get at a comprehension of a mass of ice like that. If one could cleave off the butt-end of such a glacier, an oblong block two or three miles wide by five and a quarter long and two thousand feet thick, he could completely hide the city of New York under it, and Trinity Steeple would only stick up into it relatively as far as a shingle nail would stick up into the bottom of a Saratoga trunk. The boulders from Mont Blanc, upon the plain below Ivrea, assure us that the glacier which transported them existed for a prodigious length of time. Their present distance from the cliffs from which they were derived is about 420,000 feet, and if we assume that they traveled at the rate of 400 feet per annum, their journey must have occupied them no less than 1,055 years. In all probability, they did not travel so fast. Glaciers are sometimes hurried out of their characteristic snail pace. A marvelous spectacle is presented then. Mr. Wimper refers to a case which occurred in Iceland in 1721. It seems that in the neighborhood of the mountain Kotlugia, large bodies of water formed underneath or within the glaciers, either on account of the interior heat of the earth or from other causes, and at length acquired irresistible power tore the glaciers from their mooring on the land, and swept them over every obstacle into the sea. Prodigious masses of ice were thus borne for a distance of about ten miles over land in the space of a few hours, and their bulk was so enormous that they covered the sea for seven miles from the shore, and remained aground in six hundred feet of water. The denudation of the land was upon a grand scale all superficial accumulations were swept away, and the bedrock was exposed. It was described in graphic language how all irregularities and depressions were obliterated, and a smooth surface of several miles area laid bare, and that this area had the appearance of having been planed by a plane. The account translated from the Icelandic says that the mountain-like ruins of this majestic glacier so covered the sea that as far as the eye could reach no open water was discoverable, even from the highest peaks. A monster wall or barrier of ice was built across a considerable stretch of land, too, by this strange eruption. One can form some idea of the altitude of this barrier of ice when it is mentioned that from Hoftabreka Farm, which lies high up on a fjeld, one could not see Hjordlifshofti opposite, which is a fell six hundred and forty feet in height, but in order to do so had to clamber up a mountain slope east of Hoftebreka, twelve hundred feet high. These things will help the reader to understand why it is that a man who keeps company with glaciers comes to feel tolerably insignificant by and by. The Alps and the glaciers together are able to take every bit of conceit out of a man and reduce his self-importance to zero if he will only remain within the influence of their sublime presence long enough to give it a fair and reasonable chance to do its work. The alpine glaciers move, that is granted now by everybody, 
but there was a time when people scoffed at the idea they said you might as well expect leagues of solid rock to crawl along the ground as expect leagues of ice to do it but proof after proof was furnished and finally the world had to believe the wise men not only said the glacier moved but they timed its movement they ciphered out a glacier's gait and then said confidently that it would travel just so far in so many years there is record of a striking and curious example of the accuracy which may be attained in these reckonings in eighteen twenty the ascent of mont blanc was attempted by a russian and two englishmen with seven guides they had reached a prodigious altitude and were approaching the summit when an avalanche swept several of the party down a sharp slope of two hundred feet and hurled five of them all guides into one of the crevices of a glacier the life of one of the five was saved by a long barometer which was strapped to his back it bridged the crevice and suspended him until help came the alpenstock or baton of another saved its owner in a similar way three men were lost pierre balmat pierre carrier and auguste tairaz they had been hurled down into the fathomless great deeps of the crevice Dr. Forbes, an English geologist, had made frequent visits to the Mont Blanc region, and had given much attention to the disputed question of the movement of glaciers. During one of these visits he completed his estimates of the rate of movement of the glacier which had swallowed up the three guides, and uttered the prediction that the glacier would deliver up its dead at the foot of the mountain thirty-five years from the time of the accident, or possibly forty. A dull, slow journey a movement imperceptible to any eye, but it was proceeding nevertheless and without cessation. It was a journey which a rolling stone would make in a few seconds. The lofty point of departure was visible from the village below in the valley. The prediction cut curiously close to the truth. Forty-one years after the catastrophe, the remains were cast forth at the foot of the glacier. I find an interesting account of the matter in the Histoire du Mont Blanc by Stephen Darve. I will condense this account as follows. On the 12th of August, 1861, at the hour of the close of Mass, a guide arrived out of breath at the Mairie of Chamonix, and bearing on his shoulders a very lugubrious burden. It was a sack filled with human remains which he had gathered from the orifice of a crevice in the Glacier des Bossons. He conjectured that these were remains of the victims of the catastrophe of 1820, and a minute inquest, immediately instituted by the local authorities, soon demonstrated the correctness of his supposition. The contents of the sack were spread upon a long table and officially inventoried as follows. Portions of three human skulls, several tufts of black and blonde hair, a human jaw furnished with fine white teeth, a forearm and hand, all the fingers of the latter intact. The flesh was white and fresh, and both the arm and hand preserved a degree of flexibility in the articulations. The ring finger had suffered a slight abrasion, and the stain of the blood was still visible and unchanged after forty-one years. A left foot, the flesh white and fresh. Along with these fragments were portions of waistcoats, hats, hobnail shoes, and other clothing, a wing of a pigeon with black feathers, a fragment of an alpenstock, a tin lantern, and lastly a boiled leg of mutton, the only flesh among all the remains that exhaled an unpleasant odor. The guide said that the mutton had no odor when he took it from the glacier. An hour's exposure to the sun had already begun the work of decomposition upon it. Persons were called for to identify these poor pathetic relics, and a touching scene ensued. Two men were still living who had witnessed the grim catastrophe of nearly half a century before, Marie Couté, saved by his baton, and Julien Davoisou, saved by the barometer. These aged men entered and approached the table. Davoisou, more than eighty years old, contemplated the mournful remains mutely, and with a vacant eye, for his intelligence and his memory were torpid with age. But Couté's faculties were still perfect at seventy-two, and he exhibited strong emotion. He said, Pierre Balma was fair. He wore a straw hat. This bit of skull, with the tuft of blond hair, was his. This is his hat. Pierre Carrier was very dark. This skull was his, 
and this felt hat. This is Balmat's hand. I remember it so well." And the old man bent down and kissed it reverently, then closed his fingers upon it in an affectionate grasp, crying out, "'I could never have dared to believe that before quitting this world it would be granted me to press once more the hand of one of those brave comrades, the hand of my good friend Balmat. There is something weirdly pathetic about the picture of that white-haired veteran greeting with his loving handshake this friend who had been dead forty years. When these hands met last, they were alike in the softness and freshness of youth. Now one was brown and wrinkled and horny with age, while the other was still as young and fair and blemishless as if those forty years had come and gone in a single moment, leaving no mark of their passage. Time had gone on in one case, it had stood still in the other. A man who has not seen a friend for a generation keeps him in mind always as he saw him last, and is somehow surprised, and is also shocked, to see the aging change the years have wrought when he sees him again. Marie Coutet's experience in finding his friend's hand unaltered from the image of it which he had carried in his memory for forty years is an experience which stands alone in the history of man, perhaps. Coutet identified other relics. This hat belonged to Auguste Tairaz. He carried the cage of pigeons which we proposed to set free upon the summit. Here is the wing of one of those pigeons, and here is the fragment of my broken baton. It was by grace of that baton that my life was saved. Who could have told me that I should one day have the satisfaction to look again upon this bit of wood that supported me above the grave that swallowed up my unfortunate companions? No portions of the body of Tairaz, other than a piece of the skull, had been found. A diligent search was made, but without result. However, another search was instituted a year later, and this had better success. Many fragments of clothing which had belonged to the lost guides were discovered. Also part of a lantern, and a green veil with blood-stains on it. But the interesting feature was this. One of the searchers came suddenly upon a sleeved arm projecting from a crevice in the ice wall, with a hand outstretched as if offering greeting. The nails of this white hand were still rosy and the pose of the extended fingers seemed to express an eloquent welcome to the long-lost light of day. The hand and arm were alone. There was no trunk. After being removed from the ice, the flesh tints quickly faded out, and the rosy nails took on an alabaster hue of death. This was the third right hand found. Therefore all three of the lost men were accounted for, beyond cavil or question. Dr. Hamel was the Russian gentleman of the party which made the ascent at the time of the famous disaster. He left Chamonix as soon as he conveniently could after the descent, and, as he had shown a chilly indifference about the calamity, and offered neither sympathy nor assistance to the widows and orphans, he carried with him the cordial execrations of the whole community. Four months before the first remains were found, a Chamonix guide named Balmat, a relative of one of the lost men, was in London, and one day encountered a hale old gentleman in the British Museum who said, "'I overheard your name. Are you from Chamonix, Monsieur Balmat?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Haven't they found the bodies of my three guides yet? I am Dr. Hamel.' "'Alas, no, monsieur.' "'Well, you'll find them sooner or later.' "'Yes. It is the opinion of Dr. Forbes and Mr. Tyndale that the glacier will sooner or later restore to us the remains of the unfortunate victims. Without a doubt, without a doubt, and it will be a great thing for Chamonix, in the matter of attracting tourists, you can get up a museum with those remains that will draw. This savage idea has not improved the odor of Dr. Hamel's name in Chamonix by any means. But, after all, the man was sound on human nature. His idea was conveyed to the public officials of Chamonix, and they gravely discussed it around the official council table. They were only prevented from carrying it into execution by the determined opposition of the friends and descendants of the lost guides, who insisted on giving the remains Christian burial, and succeeded in their purpose. A close watch had to be kept upon all the poor remnants and fragments to prevent embezzlement. 
a few accessory odds and ends were sold rags and scraps of the coarse clothing were parted with at the rate equal to about twenty dollars a yard a piece of a lantern and one or two other trifles brought nearly their weight in gold and an englishman offered a pound sterling for a single breeches button End of chapter 40